Um, I'm glad you chose that song, um, Waymaker, because I had that word, this statement in it, this God, that is who you are. And because um, at the top of my sermon notes, I wrote down today my sermon was called, That's Just Who We Are. <laughs> so it fits very well. So, uh, you know, across the course of my, um, my married life with my wife Fleur over there, um, we've moved around quite a lot. Um, a lot of it's been due to employment, going to from different jobs, uh, and hopefully a lot of it has also been God's leading and taking us into different places. Uh, when we were first married, uh, about a year after we were married, we moved to the US for two years and lived over there for, and, worked, and worked over there. When we came back to South Australia, couldn't find work, so we ended up going to Gippsland in Victoria five or six years and then moved back to South Australia for about another six, seven years and then back to Melbourne and recently came up here to Lismore. So moved around a little bit. And one of the things that really has assisted then at those transitions and helped us was finding a local church in each of the places that we went to. Local church for us was really important to then finding connection and finding people and it's having a sense where you can, you know, you're not lost in the wilderness and you've got a place where you can come to and you belong. Been through lots of different versions of local churches, from cafe churches through to quite um, orthodox uh, um, sessions, uh, you know, ones where we have communion only once a month to every week, uh, you know, all the different versions, and a number of different denominations across that time. But at the core of it, local church is, there's a lot of things that are similar, a lot of things that make it up and why it's important. I have this real sense that local church is being, God is really challenging and really wanting local church to be, have a new emphasis and to rise up again. And Al, I've talked with Alan about the same thing and he's, his sense is the same thing, you know, that there's, there's a lot of uh, undercurrent across the world now that you know, that God wants his local church to begin taking its place again and becoming a new importance. More and more I've read recently, the more I've come to believe that the local church is one of God's key strategies actually for bringing the kingdom of God to this earth. You know, this is how he plans to actually impact the world, not through individuals, not through mega churches, not through great evangelists, but through his local church. And you know, I think it's really important then that we understand what are some of the aspects of why that comes together. So what, when we say local church, I mean, I'm wondering what, what you think that is. Uh, you know, sometimes we think of church as being the building. And, uh, and though we call it a church, I don't think that is what actual local church is. I don't think one denomination is the church even though they call themselves, you know, like Churches of Christ or the Baptist Church, they are not really the church, local church either. I don't even think it's even defined by the activities or the events or whatever happens. That doesn't make it church. And even what we do on a Sunday morning, we come, we're going to church, but in a way, this Sunday service is not really church. And COVID showed us in a game that you know you could you could still be a church and not actually get meet together in a and have the service. For me, I think what makes local church and what it is is the people. It's a collection of all of us together that make up local church. The group who meet together as a body of local believers, and the ragtag collection of all of who we are, you know, what we bring comes together and because we all and what brings us together is the one thing and that is our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. There's nothing else that would draw a lot of us together and be in the same place really, you know, like we wouldn't necessarily be in the same social groups if it wasn't for that one thing that brings us together. Most of the letters in the New Testament were written to local churches. Most of them were written to churches uh, or a group of churches or an individual church. And in one of the letters, Paul writes to the Corinthian church. And Corinth was a, um, a metropolitan that was, and it was a, a merging church, but it was having lots of issues and struggles. 
the people who were struggling to work out what it actually meant to be a Christian church, what it meant to be a body of believers coming together. And there was lots of division, there was lots of um, obsession with, you know, who was in this bit and who was in that bit. And there was a lot of a sense where it was all about themselves and how they looked. And Paul writes a letter in Corinthians that really challenges uh, that whole idea and ch- urges them to begin to see what it actually means to have faith. And he calls them in this one particular passage, he, he uses the metaphor of a body to describe the local church. And I w- want to just uh, go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to 27, if you want to look at that in your Bibles with me. And in this passage, uh, you know, in, in my Bible, it probably wasn't in the original uh, letter, but it says one body with many parts. That's what they call this bit of scripture. It starts off and it says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptised into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. Yet the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And the ear says I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are totally the most necessary. And the parts we regarded as less honourable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honourable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honour and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honoured, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is part of it. What a powerful statement. That together, each of us become Christ's body. Each of us is one of the many parts that make up the body. That is, each of us together become the local church. You know, I'm not going to say, well, I don't think we gain much by trying to stretch the metaphor to identify, you know, what part we are. You know, like, you know, is Daniel the voice uh, or is is Rod the dancing feet? Uh, (laughs) You know, that's, I don't think that's where it's heading. It's not trying to say, but it's trying to say we are all different. We are all come with different aspects but joined together we become the body of Christ in verse 18 it's interesting it says that God has arranged the parts in the body the way he wanted and in verse 24 it says he has so adjusted the body those Greek words are quite strong in this idea that he has arranged that he has set he has adjusted he has put together mingled the various parts of the body just as the way he wanted it to be. I want you to think on that for a minute. That he has so arranged this body, this local church, with the people that he wants at this time to be here. He's not just flung together a group of people. It's not just that we've drawn and and we've decided to join. In fact, God's been working in that behind the scenes, organising to bring this church together and bring the group of people here that are the believers. If he's so arranged each of us, he's done it for something according to his plan. He's put us together to fulfil a purpose that this church is here for. 
purpose that I'm going to suggest to you is not just the church purposes, but is also linked to your individual and your family purposes. That together they work together and all come, come out. And further, that is also the, this local communities, uh, it, the impact that God wants to have on that. So we're joined together that we would become something that God can use and that we can together for, have an impact. In another letter to a church, Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, and I need to get that. Sorry? <laughs> I, I, I could call you up to tell you a joke. <laughs> Jad, that, we were with Daniel the other night and he, and he went to tell a joke and he couldn't remember it and he had to look it up on his phone so we were waiting in anticipation. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, so in 19, it says, um, where are we? So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and their prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles are being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What a beautiful passage again that talks about how we are joined together, how he has drawn us, and that Christ is at the centre of it, and that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that a lot of the letters are written to churches and but we often read them as if we are in they're written to us as individuals and a lot of it it's some of the language is because it says you are and we and we we interpret the you as being you know me rather than seeing the you as being the church yet in some sense the Ephesian passage is saying we together are the temple of the spirit not I am a temple or you're a temple. And this Christian life we are called to is more a centred around we than me. Ephesians says there is one body and one spirit. However, we've given each of us a special gift. So he goes on and says this and he says that these gifts include church leadership and that there are... The, that these are given to equip God's people to his work and build up the church and the body of Christ. So in some ways, leadership is just a gift that some people are given. Other people are given other gifts, like administration, like putting seats out. And all of those gifts in God's eyes are equal. He doesn't lift up leadership or the worship leader or the prayer leader and say they are more special than someone else because they do those things. He says everybody is equal and every part they play is because that is what I want them to do at that time. Each of us has a part to play and no one is more special than another. Together we are this temple and our gifts and skills together help develop each of us to grow. You know, when Paul wrote to the Corinth church, I mentioned how it was so divisive and there was this whole issue about, you know, who, you know, I got saved by Apollos or I got saved by this person and there was this, all this, you know, segregation going on about who was better and who was standing up and who, and he really challenges that and says, you know, those things don't matter. That you are all equal you are and in fact Peter writes the same thing when he writes to the church and he says we are all priests nobody is higher than anybody else we are all together form the one living stone under Christ as the true cornerstone so together we are living stones that are part of the church and we all have the one testimony and one faith so we should act and feel like a body with everybody connected the passage in Corinthians talks about how if one suffers, 
We all suffer. And that's how a local community and a local church should be. You know, like we should be there for when the weakest person is struggling, we should be around them and helping them, not judging them or calling them account. We need to be with them, hold them and help them through. And that's a challenge of how to do that, how to stand with those that are struggling in their time so that when they, can, when they rise up, they can then stand with others. Together, we can help and support those that are broken, those who are struggling, those who are weakest and least, and help them become stronger down the track. This concept of using our gifts to grow each of us and work together is one of the core vocations of the local church that we call, in some words, discipleship. And I think discipleship is a lot more than just getting people to understand what is the church doctrine, or what is the latest fad that you need to understand? Or how do you fit nicely into the church? Discipleship was always meant to be about how do you actually help someone become more Christ-like? How to help someone become more uh, impactful in the world? How to begin to explore their giftings that God has placed upon them so that they can actually serve the church, serve the community and serve their families? Discipleship was designed to equip us and empower us. And the community of, of the church is actually one of the primary contexts in which God uses for discipleship. This is how we learn how to live a Christian life, as we walk together, as we observe each other, as we see modelled by others, as we spend time with those around us. That's his, you know, we, we know that as a, we become new Christians, there's a walk that we need to have about how to actually begin to walk in faith. And it's not about actually saying all the right things or doing all the right things. It's about actually learning what it means in our heart and in our day-to-day -day lives of how to live that out. A guy called Rodney Stark uh, was a sociologist and he, he decided to research the question of whether religion actually had any power to regulate human behaviour. So he, wanted, he wasn't a Christian at at this stage. He later became a Christian, but at that time he wasn't. And he, he actually said, well, you know, everybody says religion changes people and, you know, helps people. So he, want, he went and looked at people who had addictive behaviours, drug and alcohol, gambling, uh, and also criminal behaviours and said, you know, does religion actually change people? And he did a really thorough analysis of looking at all these different uh, people that had, that had uh, walked through those different uh, settings. What he found was just coming to faith, making a faith decision, made some change. But what changed people the most was when they joined with a local community of faith. When they joined with a positive community that stood around them and helped them, that's when real change occurred. When they sat in a moral-based community for a length of time, they changed and moulded mold, themselves into the, the community of the morals that sat in that space. Making ourselves accountable within a small group like a local church helps us to grow, helps us to change, helps us to become who Christ wants us to be. It's an opportunity to put into practice behaviours that we might not try anywhere else and learn how to actually live in this new space hopefully with little judgment or criticism. Growing as disciples occurs best in community. And most of our change occurs when we are with people, when we are accountable to people. And I think the local church community is a vital part of this. It's a key to the formation of people becoming more Christ-like. It is in our gathering with fellow believers that we begin to understand who we are, how we are to act, and that the story we live in. Because the surrounding culture will continually put out a different direction and different idea. But we need our life together to remind us of what it means to live in Christ. So together we support, encourage, lift, and hold each other accountable. We also know that when we are doing things by ourselves, it can be a real struggle. But when you join together with others, 
you actually can achieve better, more things. We can have greater impact in all that we do when we are work in teams, when we, when we share our skills, when we share our experiences, when one is flagging, the other one gives them energy. We know these things work. Ecclesiastes says, in four, chapter 4, 9 to 12, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if ever either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. It goes on down the bottom and says, If someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. When people work together, they bring different gifts and skills that together they could not achieve the same thing. So as we join together in a church and bring our skills together, you know, um, like the, the children's church, when they, all the groups of people join and bring all their skills, they can impact those children far better than one person trying to be the leader, trying to do it all by themselves. The church community, however, is not just also about what we meeting together, a social gathering, but it's also meant to be a display of God's redemptive work to the world. The church is intended to see who God is through the work of the local church. It's, you know, it's meant to see the self-sacrificing love, the forgiveness, the support that stands in contrast to the world. John says, by, you know, it's by our love and care for one another, that people will understand that, you know, we are Christians. Before the church is called to do anything, it is called to demonstrate the love of Christ to a fallen world. Theologian George Hunsberger stated, Christians must demonstrate what life looks like under the reign of God within a district community of the church. The church displays the first fruits of the forgiven and forgiving people of God who are brought together under the cross of Christ. Together we demonstrate why Christ is. More and more, you know, we've had scientists that are now recognising the importance of communities to the point where governments have tried to work out how, to, how they might create community, you know, how they might legislate it, 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 to bring people together in communities and force them into their spaces. They've done it through funding. They've done it in all sorts of different ways. But really, what the government and what the world can produce as community are not the same as what the church can do. And I believe that God is wanting us to establish communities that can reach out to a world that's in desperate need of finding places where they can find acceptance, love and belonging. The community needs to begin to see the church as a partner, an ally, in a broken and distressed world. But often they do see the church as being, you know, like a religion, as, you know, you ever see portrays on TV, you know, there's always the church is seen as being inefficient and weak and, you know, stupid people doing weird things. They're just there to take your money. But the world needs to see the church in action and see, see the local church out there doing things and sharing sharing with the community in ways that make sense. I found these particular notes when I was sort of looking to bring this servant again. I can't remember who actually wrote this or where I got it from, but the, I really loved what the writer said. And they, the writer said, The kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking or musical styles. It should be a republic of love, fierce, wild, huge, feisty, pure love that makes the church relevant, but is... But is not, but is absent in the world. Is this love in church such that people in the world and of the world would be willing to forsake all other loves just to know this love? Would they give up their addictions, their divisions, their compromises, their resentments because the love of, the, of our church was so much better and truer and deeper than anything they had found anywhere else? Where what is often lacking is extravagance of love, a bigness of heart that seeks the others, not even the unlovely and unlovable, to lavish love on them, a pouring out and overflowing. Without extravagant love, the church will never turn the world on its head. In fact, it won't even turn the world's head. 
Without love, the church will leave the world exactly as it is found. God has designed his church to be both the locus and channel for his divine love. What powerful words and idea. One of the things that I believe that, the, that is really important is that the local church becomes a place where people can find safety, acceptance and belonging. People are screaming out for that and they're looking for it in all different places. They're looking for it in gangs. They're looking for it in uh, you know, gambling centres. They're looking for it in sports teams. They're looking for it uh, in, you know, unfortunately I was, I was saying to someone the other day, you know, that people said they find more acceptance and love in Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous than they do in the church. And it, that's a sad thing to think of, you know, like that they're searching but they can't find that sort of love and acceptance. A researcher found that in a in the UK uh, that 85% of people who came to faith did so when they joined with a community of uh, uh, believers or a small group and they joined with them and over time they said, I like what these people will believe and, and then that drew them into actually making a faith decision. We have this idea in our head, you know, like it's all about just preaching and if we just preach the gospel to someone, that's the first thing that needs to happen. Then we'll draw them into the church and, and help them belong. But all the research seems to indicate if we actually have communities where we can bring people in and connect with them and give them a safe place where they can find acceptance and love, they will then make faith decisions and then they will join with that community and go forward. You know... People who are hurt and broken struggle with this idea of acceptance. They struggle to put their trust in a God who they actually think of as, the, you know, they, they think of God often as the father that they've had or the, the people in their lives that have let them down. And so trust it becomes a huge thing. And when we say to them, well, trust in God, believe in Jesus, it's something that they find really hard. But when they live and work in a community and, and spend time in a place where they can find that trust and see it work out in other people's lives, they can begin to say, that is a place maybe I can move towards. Together, we should be a place that creates a place of belonging, a place of safety, a place of acceptance. I want to just finish off by telling this little story from a um, writer called Megan Hill. Um, she's a U US writer. She wrote a book called A Place to Belong. And she tells the story of a man called Jim. Jim was uh, born in a broken family and he only really knew his mother until he was nine years old and then his mother died of a drug overdose. Then he went into, uh, into care, foster care initially, and then into care homes. But he pretty much spent the later parts of his youth on the streets Got ill into a lot of crime, was in and out of uh, youth justice facilities and even in his young adult then got into, um, his drugs were still part of his life and he still did a lot of burglary and a lot of offending and ended up with quite a long stint in a um, federal jail. While he was in jail, he said he got to know the chaplain and the chaplain talked to him about Jesus and he said, you know, I knew that this is, was the answer. And I, want, and, I, and I said the words and he said, I, I really said that I want to, you know, this Jesus in my life. And so I knew this and, and I could see some changes. But he said, when you're in prison, you don't change much. You, you've got to live with the world the way it is. And he said, it was really hard to, to put into action anything that I was thinking. But when he came out, he joined with a local church. And at the, in this local church, he started attending the Bible studies. He started sending, they did Sunday school, you know, in the US they do Sunday school before church, you know. And he went to that and he's, he's, more and more he grew and more and more he became, um, you know, a, a very strong Christian in his faith. At one meeting, he, they got him up and he actually told his testimony and he talked about how, how God had changed his life and now he had a different focus. But he finished up with this statement. He said, I have never had a people before. I've never had a place where I felt like I belonged. 
Now I do. This local church. Local church is important. Together, 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 we can do amazing things, both for us as individuals, for us as families, for this community. That is who we are, the local church. And God is calling us to rise up and to become more fully in that and understand more fully what that means. Let's pray. Look, God, you've challenged us with this idea that local church is important in our lives. Help us to see the things that we need to see with that around us as families, uh, how we might work with that, the things that we need to develop, the things we need to grow in, how we can participate in this local church and be part of it. What can I bring? What part am I that I need to be who I am? How can I continue to grow and develop? How can we reach out to this community? How can each of us help develop a space here that is a belonging space, an accepting space, a loving space for those that come in and link to us? How can we be a church that is, shows love to this community? Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to guide us. We need you to empower us. We need you to equip us. Come at this time and just move and touch each person and speak to their hearts and speak to, to, of what you need to happen. God, we place all this in your hands and we place this local church in your hands. We thank you. We thank you for Alan and Jackie and other leadership here that you've gifted us with as they guide this church forward. Continue to live through them and teach through them and, and lead through them and, and equip and empower each of us to be who we need to be. I praise you for them, Lord, and thank you for them. I thank you for this local church, Lord, and I thank you what you want to do with it and where you want to take it. In your name we pray. Amen.